Welcome back to It's Too Late to Apologize Book Reviews. I'm Stella, and today I want to talk about Faust by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. This is the Princeton edition, and it's been translated by Stuart Atkins and contains the infamous and hard to find unabridged Faust Part Two. And now I understand why an unabridged version was so hard to come by. La sigh. Faust is a tragic play in two parts. It was published in 1806 and revised in an 1828 to 1829 edition, and part two was published in 1831. It's widely known as one of, if not the best work of German literature of all time. Faust part one is about God making a pact with the demon Mephistopheles in a very book of job-like fashion over the soul of Heinrich Faust a scholar who is disillusioned with his lifelong pursuit of knowledge as he believes he has pursued a righteous path but feels no closer understanding the world. Faust even turns to magic but finds no answers there either, and so he contemplates suicide. Instead, he goes for a walk and is followed home by a stray black poodle. The poodle is Mephistopheles, who is not the devil but a lesser Denny's of hell. Faust and Mephistopheles, who I'm going to call Mephisto from here on in for my sanity's sake, strike a bargain. If Mephisto can show Faust, who is tired of his dull life, such a good time that Faust wants to stay in that moment, then Mephisto gets his soul. So clearly, with his soul on the line, they then go to a bar. Later after that, they chat up a witch, but then meet Marguerite, known as Gretchen. Faust with Mephisto's help, seduces her, kills both her mother and her brother, Gretchen becomes pregnant and ends up drowning the child and is convicted of murder and awaits her death sentence in prison. Faust, during a party on a mountaintop, sees a vision of Gretchen in prison. He demands that Mephisto help him save her from execution. Mephisto does, but when they get to Gretchen, she refuses any help from Mephisto and chooses to face her fate. Voices from heaven announce that she will be saved, but she is executed for her crime, and Faust disappears with Mephisto. <sighs> Where to start? I think I'm going to need something stronger than coffee for this one. So this play has three different beginnings. The first opening is a scene with a poet, a stage manager, and an actor. It's basically an argument about a writer's struggle and freedom to create his art and how difficult it can be to satisfy those who consume his art. The stage manager wants the poet to write a play that will make him money. The actor wants him to write a play that the people will laugh at and love the actor for. And the poet wants to write a story that means something. It's like the poet is saying, it's not my fault if this play sucks. Look who I have to please with frivolity. Oh, Goethe, things have not changed. The second opening is between God and Mephisto. They place a wager over Faust's soul. God seems to be a betting man. I mean, if you were the guy who created humanity, I think you'd have to be. I find it humorous, though, that as God looks down and points Faust out to Mephisto and is all, look at this guy. He's doing great. This is, this is a work of art down here. Faust is actually considering suicide. It's humorous, I think, but one might also say that it was exactly why God sent Mephisto to Faust, so that Faust could find a reason to live. Mephisto is the most interesting and charismatic character in the story, though. Faust is not likable and is even despicably weak and self-absorbed. And because of that, it makes sense that Mephisto is more interesting and likable. How else would he tempt man, if not? But even though Faust is really unlikable, he is all of us. Unlikable, weak, self-absorbed. Faust thinks he's so smart, but he's really not. He believes he's in control of this entire situation but when he invites and conjures Mephisto out of the harmless little poodle. Faust makes the wager with Mephisto, thinking he's in control of the situation, as if he controls his destiny. But God made a bet, and because of that bet, Faust gets to place his wager in the first place. Because of God's bet, Faust believes he is master of his own destiny. Like, wow. There's a lot to unpack in just that. In reality, Faust is in control of nothing. And quickly you see by Faust's actions that he is no brilliant being, as none of us are. Frequently, Faust demands things from Mephisto, extremely selfish things, 
and even Mephisto asks him if he's sure if he wants to do that, displaying that even Mephisto has a better sense of morality than this supposed wise man. And Faust, through his selfish acts, brings doom upon not himself, but upon the woman who loves him and his own child. Marguerite is responsible for killing her own child, but through Faust's selfishness, he murders her mother because of Mephisto, so that he can sleep with Marguerite, and then murders Valentine, her brother, when he defends his sister's honor. Mephisto is also guilty and for the whole tragedy. And then when Marguerite is left all alone in life, she's like 14 years old at this point, and Faust goes off to party with Mephisto at a festival. She's pregnant and alone in a society that will not accept her. She has sinned, and she sees no way out of her situation. She has no way to care for this baby. And so she kills her baby and is then ready to die as a recourse for her actions. But what a Faust. What does he get? I'll tell you what he gets. He gets another chance in part two. But let's go back for one second. I feel as if this whole bet, this wager between God and Mephisto, is also related to the opening scene with the stage manager, the actor and the poet. The poet doesn't control his fate either, and he plays God in his work. He creates things. He is master of his creation. Yet he also has constraints. He has to appease the actor and the, and the audience and the stage manager. God can do as he pleases, yet also he takes up Mephisto on his bet. Is it God's choice? Must God make a wager with the devil at all? Can good exist without evil? Does God exist without the devil? There's so much to unpack just in that. I find it really interesting, this comparison, and I always do find it really interesting, this, this back and forth between predestined fate and self-determination. And it, it's something that I'm, uh, it's a theme in what my, the novel that I'm working on right now. And I, I find it so interesting not because, not from like a the theological standpoint where some people might, um, you know, perceive that um, debate coming from, and, and that's okay if it is, but I don't really take that perspective. My perspective is more from a point of the philosophy of Stoicism, which is something that resonates with me. And it's this idea of knowing what you can control and what you can't, and what's out of your control is really doesn't require much more thought other than how you per, you will spin the perception of it within yourself, making it positive or negative or anything like that. Really, all that you can control is what you can control. But if you can't control your outcome, then what is in your control? If it is everything is predestined, then do you control nothing then? And I have these really interesting debates with a good friend of mine who is a psychiatric nurse. Who, so he's taken a lot of um, psychology courses, and we always have fascinating debates. And I mean, from his standpoint, from what he's told in school or taught, is that th there is no such thing as free will. That behavioral-wise and, and thought-wise, that basically that um, there is no free will like it's all not necessarily predetermined but you are not in control of your actions you are simply responding to stimulus in a way that you're uh, you've sort of been programmed to and I, I i just i don't i just don't agree with that i mean i'm i'm no you know i'm no psychologist i don't have a degree in any of that but i just feel like it's a road to nihilism and i just if, if something, something may be true, but if it doesn't help you live your life, then I just think you should ignore it. And the idea that you can't even control your own actions in any small sense is, I think, insidious. But anyways, I I've gone off road here. Four by four engaged. Back to Faust. This is a play. So I try to be mindful of that. But boy, it could have used some transitions, like several. A lot of time passes and not much is explained. And I found myself often wondering and checking if I'd missed a page. And then the first scene with the witch and the monkeys. 
just out of nowhere, a witch and monkeys. Mephisto takes Faust to a witch to get a potion to make him look young again, because, you know, that's how you have a good time in life, apparently. And the witch is surrounded by these crazy monkeys, and it's never known why there are monkeys in this scene. Maybe one could think that the monkeys were other people who had gone to the witch in search of some potion, but had been transformed into a primate instead, a lesser evolved version of themselves. Perhaps that is the punishment for vanity, to be trapped in a regressed version of oneself. I was reading this with a writer friend at the time, and we joked about how there was no meaning behind the monkey and that Goethe just like threw them in for funsies. My buddy said he was gonna throw a monkey into his current work in progress just for shits and giggles. And Jeff, if you're watching this, I can't wait to read the current edit. There's also this theme of imprisonment. Faust considers his study to be a prison. Mephisto is imprisoned in Hell's Pit. And of course, Gretchen is imprisoned for killing her baby. Prison is a way of atoning for one's wrongdoing. But I feel what's also interesting is that Faust learned all of his knowledge through books and reasoning. But he was unsatisfied, and so he goes to live his life again, physically this time, to experience his life firsthand. Gretchen is so young in comparison. I think Faust is something, I mean, he's gotta be somewhere in his 50s, and, and Gretchen is like 14 years old. So again, Gretchen is so young in comparison to Faust, but experiences her life and makes mistakes, but understands her hypocrisy when she was cruel to another pregnant unmarried woman and tries to change herself. She understands this at such a young age, and Faust does not. I feel Goethe is saying that experiencing life teaches more lessons than reading about life does. And that's definitely true, I think. Even in, you know, in, there's so much you can learn from books and study and, and school and all those sorts of things. But, you know, even in sciences, like you need to go to the lab and, and do the experiments and experience the, the theory firsthand. And then you realize things like, Things like thermal losses and coefficients of friction and rates of thermal expansion, how they change your, the expected outcome that s theoretically seemed like it should be the case, but it's not because there are these other elements that happen in reality that are difficult to account for in, in theory until witnessed in reality. And so that is a really good analogy for life. Like you cannot just sit by the sidelines watching everyone else live or or thinking you know about life or thinking you're so wise when you haven't experienced it and i think that's what goethe is trying to tell us faust part two is convoluted and bloated and just read the abridged version if you have to read it okay i found this really great youtube channel called somner's world literature to go he acts out literature with um the German equivalent of Legos, and I'll link Faust part one and two of his videos in the description box. I literally laughed out loud while watching part one. But in the end of Faust part two, Faust is saved because he tried. I don't know about you, but I, I felt bad for Mephisto for having to have hung out with Faust for all that time, and he doesn't even get his soul, and he should have got his soul. So when it comes to Faust, I can't say that I necessarily enjoyed reading Faust. It wasn't an enjoyable read. Oftentimes I find with difficult literature is it's not about the enjoyment. It's about what it's trying to tell you. And what I can say is that while writing this review, I realized how much I actually did get out of Faust. I don't know about you, but I'm quite an intuitive reader, and intuitive sounds extremely pretentious, and that's not what I mean by it. What I mean by intuitive is literally, I will come to a conclusion, I will read something, come to a conclusion in my head, and have no real idea how I got to that conclusion, because I don't, I think very abstractly. And so what I find, what I really liked about Faust and, you know, my, my goal with when I write these reviews or, or deliver these reviews to you is that I'm trying to verbalize and, and understand why I've come to certain conclusions. And, and it's, it's kind of like connecting the dots. And, um, and, and I find that when I sit and really think about why I've come to certain conclusions, 
that I have about Faust, for example, or any other um, difficult work of literature is where, where the enjoyment is for me in, in reading it. I get a lot out of that, and I think I'm trying to get better at it. This isn't, I'm not very good at this, which might be clearly obvious by these videos. What I'm trying to say is, while I didn't enjoy reading Faust, I really enjoyed the experience of dissecting it and delving deeper into it and trying to understand what Goethe was trying to tell the reader to me and you and anyone else who has to read this, probably for a course, because I feel like that's most of my viewers. <laughs> is someone who probably was told they have to read this book and is, is trying to find a review to try to help them understand it. I highly recommend trying it. Even if I didn't enjoy it, I will always recommend for you to read the book and, and have your own opinion on it because, I mean, what do I know? Not much. I will say early on in the first part of Faust, um, this sort of back and forth with Mephisto and Faust and even Faust and his um, assistant or um, Wagner, Wagner, they're, the writing and is so good in, the, in a few of these passages and I'm just going to read one out loud for you. Faust and Mephistopheles, after they've made their wager, Faust says, no matter what I wear, I hardly can escape the torment of a life confined to earth. I am too old to live for pleasure only, and too young to be without desire. What can I hope for from this world? You must abstain, refrain, renounce. This is the everlasting song in every ear, one that, our whole life long, we hear each hour hoarsely singing. When morning comes, I always wake in terror and feel like shedding bitter tears, because the day I see will not fulfill a single wish of mine before it's over will dampen any faintest hope of pleasure by its capricious strictures and with a thousand petty matters will stifle the creative urge that stirs my heart at nightfall too i'm filled with apprehension when it is time to go to bed for there as well i fail to gain repose and will be frightened by wild dreams the god that dwells within my breast can deeply stir my inmost being and one that governs all my faculties cannot realize its purpose. And so for me, existence is a burden, death to be welcomed, and this life detested. And then Faust continues to, to say to Mephistopheles, though then sweet music, long familiar, rescued me from a host of terrors and echoes of early happier times, confused that still remain of childhood feelings, and now can only curse all the enticements that delude my soul with cheating visions and powers of persuasion and deception that hold it here within its dreary cave. Cursed be to start the high opinion that the mind has of itself. Cursed be what as appearance intrudes on and deludes our senses. And cursed be the falseness of our dreams, their empty promise of lasting name. Cursed be what flatters us as things we own, as wife and child and fields our workmen plow. Cursed be the mammon too both when he and his treasures entice us to bold enterprise and when to provide us idle pleasure, he cushions us bed of ease. A curse be upon the nectar of the vine, a curse upon love's highest favors, a curse upon hope, a curse on faith, but curse be patience most of all. Some really good stuff in there. Like Faust is just so done, so done. So I recommend you read Faust. Give it a try. See what you think. If you've read it, let me know down below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.